Open in your Bibles with me, please, to the sixth chapter of Revelation. And in the next few moments, we're going to cover perhaps one of the most uh, important chapters of this book because it answers the question for the greatest mystery in the world today. And that mystery is, why is God so patient as sin runs ravagingly through this world? Why is it that there's no village or town without its seething black drop? Why is it that every family will sooner or later dissolve and the circle of the family will descend into the depths of the grave as death and sin and God's patience mysteriously allow this process to go forward. Why God delights in taking the kingdom to himself, this is the most inexplicable mystery that our minds could dream of. It's the mystery of the presence of evil, and for these thousands of years, God has allowed Satan to wrap his vicious, slimy, filthy, cruel tentacles around human life and throughout this earth. Does God not know what's going on? Is he indifferent? Is he not able to cope with it? Oh, the mystery of God's delay. That mystery has brought stumbling, more stumbling to the faith of God's people than any other experience in all of life. The infidel, the atheist, the agnostic, the unbeliever, they laugh, they mock at us, and God lets them mock at us. Our missionaries are slain, churches are burned to the ground, people on this earth live by the uncounted millions and millions are oppressed, they live in despair, and God just looks on. He seemingly is not interfering. He does not say anything. He does not move. Sin just develops. It grows. It goes on. Oh, the mystery of the delay of our Lord God. But somewhere beyond the clouds, an angel is poised. And at the sounding of his trumpet, God shall say, the kingdoms of this world shall become the kingdoms of God, and he shall reign forever and ever. And when that trumpet sounds and when God intervenes, the world will take note of it. And the mystery of God's delay shall be no more. As you open with me to verse 1, the moment when that trumpet sounds and the Lord takes back his world. As I read to you the sixth chapter of Revelation, and then we'll ask for God's special blessing upon his word. Now I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals... And I heard one of the four living creatures saying with a voice like thunder, Come and see. And I looked, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on it had a bow. And a crown was given to him, and he went out conquering and to conquer. And when he opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature saying, Come and see. And another horse, fiery red, went out. And it was granted to the one who sat on it to take peace from the earth, and that people should kill one another. And there was given to him a great sword. And when he opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, Come and see. So I looked, and behold, a black horse. And he who sat on it had a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying, A quart of wheat for a denarius, and three quarts of barley for a denarius, and do not harm the oil and the wine. When he opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature saying, Come and see. And I looked, and behold, a pale horse And the name of him who sat on it was Death, and Hades followed with him, and power was given to them over a fourth of the earth to kill with sword, with hunger, with death, and by the beasts of the earth. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held, and they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true? until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth. Then a white robe was given to each of them, and it was said to them that they should rest a little while longer, until both the number of their fellow servants and their brethren, who would be killed as they were, were completed. I looked when he opened the sixth seal, and behold, there was a great earthquake. And the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, And the moon became like blood, and the stars of heaven fell to the earth as a fig tree drops its late figs when it is shaken by a mighty wind. Then the sky receded as a scroll when it is rolled up, and every mountain and island was moved out of its place. And the 15th verse records the greatest prayer meeting in the history of the world. It says this, And the kings of the earth... 
And the great men, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, every slave and every free man hid themselves in the caves and in the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and rocks, fall on us, hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath has come. And who is able to stand? Let's bow before the Lord in prayer this morning. Oh, Father, the question you inspired John to write in his rocky exile on Patmos 2,000 years ago is a great one for each of us to ponder this morning. Who can stand before your wrath, the wrath of Jesus, the Creator, the Judge, if not our Redeemer? I pray that this morning, more than an exciting peek into the future, or maybe a gloomy forecast of the end of this world, that this morning would be a sobering time for any who are here this morning who are not prepared spiritually to stand before the wrath of you, O Christ, the Lamb. I pray they might get ready this morning, and in the privacy of their wills, they might realize that you wrote a love letter written in blood on a cross of wood where you gave your life for our sins and shed your own blood to cleanse us that some here this morning might realize for the first time their need of a Savior. And for us who are Christians, that we might realize what it is you want us to do here in the closing hours as the plague has broken out, as this world is headed toward a horrific ending. And we have the only antidote. We hold it in our hands. We possess it in our hearts. We can disperse it with our lips, speaking the wonderful words of life. And yet we're so reticent to do that. We're so not wanting to upset people, and yet they're going to the horrors of the pit. I pray that you would touch Christians, our hearts, O Lord, to be your good and faithful servants, and any lost ones who are with us, that you would that you would justify them through their faith in the finished work of Christ. May your word be magnified. May all of us who are believers be edified. May your Christ be magnified and glorified, we pray in your lovely name, Lord Jesus. Amen. You're looking at a chapter that opens what is known in the Bible as the Tribulation. It's the first step in Christ taking back the earth that is his possession that he allowed Adam to abdicate and to turn over to the God of this world, Satan. And one by one, as Christ unrolls the seals of this scroll that we saw last week in the morning and evening, as each seal is broken, Jesus takes further possession and control of his inheritance. And finally, when the seventh angel sounds in chapter 11, it's complete. And he has taken back the rule of his planet for just a moment, I'd like to take a little survey with you. I'd like to walk through the whole panorama of the tribulation. Sometimes we look so closely at one part. But if we were to put together chapter 6, chapter 8, chapter 9, and chapter 16, and we're going to cover 6 this morning, 7 tonight, but if we were to put together those four chapters, 6, 8, 9, and, and 16, this is what the dreadful details combined would be. One out of every four people die in chapter 6, some through the ravages of war, others by starvation, and amazingly, many others by the beasts of the earth. When I was a little boy, I used to think, dogs, bears, I mean, lions? Are they going to get out of the zoo? We'll see in just a moment that the beasts of the earth are with us this morning in deadly power. So whether by death that comes instantly and thus is less dreadful, or a slow and painful death that is lingering and agonizing, 25% of all the people on the earth will die. Now, the last valid count of the planet, there were 5,733,687,096 at the end of 1995, the United Nations says. So that means 1,433,421,774 people will die just in chapter 6. Do you realize that's five? times the population of our country in just one short period of time five times our population will die well that's not the end one third of all vegetation will be burned up in chapter 8 all grass every tree and everything that's green will be destroyed 
that will affect our air supply. The sun and the moon will be darkened. Nature goes into revolt at the end of chapter 8. The gates of hell open with chapter 9. Hordes of locusts the size of horses. You ever seen a locust the size, other than in Texas where they exaggerate everything? You ever seen a locust the size of a horse? Uh, and these will have stings that have the power of scorpions. They have pain. They will inflict that will last for five months. And the Bible says that people on this planet, chapter 9, verses 3 to 6, will beg God to let them die. But God won't let them die. And they will suffer this pain for months. There will be a worldwide famine unlike anything the world has ever seen. There will be a world war so bloody that the blood of those killed in the battle will flow for 200 miles long in a stream, and it will splash up to the height of the bridle of a horse. That, of course, we know is the Battle of Armageddon. All told, during the Great Tribulation, as many as half of all the living inhabitants of this planet will die. Now do you understand why the rapture is called the Blessed Hope? Who wants to go through that? And God has said his born-again one will be taken out before his wrath falls upon this planet. Jesus describes the tribulation in Matthew 24. You don't have to turn there now. But starting in verse 3 and through verse 34, Jesus tells on the side of the Mount of Olives exactly the same sequential unfurling of this scroll and every event of those seals we're looking at Jesus chronicled during his earthly life. Matthew 24, Luke 21, Mark 13, every one of them. Also, the scriptures in the Old Testament chronicle this. John gives us the great insight. But let's look at the seals one at a time and just go through. Maybe your Bible has them divided, but chapter 6, verses 1 and 2 is the first seal. And as Jesus opens the first seal, we enter into a time of false peace. And you notice that by this white horse and this person that conquers... And this, of course, is, uh, is speaking of the false Christ coming. Now, something significant, and we won't develop it fully this morning, but I'll just get you going in this direction. Every one of these seals reveals what the earth will be like without Jesus. And, and if you remember, in John's Gospel, Jesus identifies himself with some very special titles. He says, I am the bread of life, and I am the light of the world, and I am the resurrection of life, I am the door. Uh, you know, he goes through those I am's. Each one of these seals explains what earth will be like without Jesus. You know, they've never wanted him anyway, so he withdraws his restraining power. And as the expression goes, you know, people say this all the time, say, oh, all hell broke loose. But, oh, no, you will know it when all hell breaks loose. Because when Jesus withdraws his restraint, hell truly comes to earth. The first seal is, of course, without Jesus, who is the way, the truth, and the life, as John 14, 6 tells us. Without him guiding, without him is only endless lostness, and so the false Christ arises. And in chapter 6, 1 and 2, the Antichrist presents himself on the white horse, the peacemaker. And that's why the, the surest evidence that we're getting near the end is the presence of this alarming tranquility that is being fostered around the world, kind of this peace and this armament idea and this global, and when Royce and Jim and I were in Geneva last summer, about a year ago right now, we went to the United Nations hearings in Geneva for world court and world justice, they called it, and that's what our Senate is now trying to look at the treaty, whether we're going to join the world justice, whether we're going to have a common code with all the other nations of the world. And basically you've heard that Europe is boycotting us because we have capital punishment in America, and that's the global community. Well, there's going to come a leader to this global community, and he's going to rise up, and he's going to be the Messiah. He's going to bring the whole world into freedom. That's what the first seal is about. We'll see him in chapter 13. It's a picture of the release of the Antichrist into the world scene. His white horse, its rider with a bow and a crown, goes forth to conquer, and nearly with bloodless swiftness, he brings peace without a lot of bloodshed. But look at verse 3. As soon as he's in place, then it says he opens a second seal, and the red horse gets loose. And he who sat on it, it says in verse 4, takes peace from the earth. The peace that, that's so short lived from chapter 6, 1, and 2. That peace just evaporates in verse 3. 
and that is warfare. And warfare engulfs the planet. And you notice the key at the end of verse 4 says, people kill one another. Now, I don't know about you, but I keep track of statistics and the homicide rate uh, and, the, and the gang warfare rate and the murder. I mean, just this morning, someone told me that they were working in the hospital recently and, and a son shot a father. I mean, it is the most horrific thing to think about, people killing one another. That's what happens on the planet. Without Jesus, again, who said he was the door of the sheep and that he would admit us to life, apart from him, there's only hopelessness and exclusion. The red horse with a great sword given to it speaks of the unmasking of the Antichrist who brings only a false superficial peace and peace is removed and the time of killing begins. Just in warfare alone, there have been 143 chronicled wars since World War II. Just the civilian casualties have numbered over 12 million in all these outbreaks of war. You know them, Northern Ireland and, and Lebanon and you know, Northern Africa and all those things, the, the Pakistani-India problems and all that. But war itself has intensified to such a place that is so lethal without atomic weapons that most people think it would not be possible to have a prolonged war with conventional weapons. Let me explain to you what I mean, because this is talking about warfare breaking out. The standard infantry rifle of World War I was an M1. It had a little clip with eight bullets on it. So you'd go bang, 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 eight times, and then you'd have to pull out another one like they do in the war movies and jam it in there. Well, today's M16 will fire a 30-round magazine with such rapidity and with the tumbling of the bullet. Did you know when my brother was, was in the arm, my brother-in-law, he used to tell us that their favorite thing they do is they'd fill 55-gallon drums with water and they'd shoot their M16 at it and that tumbling bullet would explode the barrel. And you know what he told me? Typical military guy, he says, you ought to see what it does to bodies. That's what the world is going to see. But it's not just rifles. An A-10 attack aircraft, that's the jet, remember, from the Gulf War, carries a heavier bomb payload than the largest World War II strategic bomber. That little tiny attack aircraft carries more armament than the biggest World War II B-29 dropping its loads. The AC-130 gunship, we heard about those in the Gulf War. It's a transport aircraft that they reconfigured for fire support. Listen, it carries four 20 millimeter Vulcan cannons, each having six barrels. It has four multi-barreled 7.62 millimeter miniguns, a 40 millimeter Bofors cannon, 105 millimeter howitzer. In other words, that plane delivers more firepower than an entire infantry could in the previous two world wars. A whole infantry division doesn't have as much as one airplane has. And those aren't even our top-of-the-line high-tech stuff. Our tanks and artillery shoot twice as far and several times more rapidly and much more accurately than they did in past wars. One Soviet motorized rifle division could deliver ten times the firepower today at three times the speed than they could in the last major world conflict. This is what one person that studied this, Dr. Gabriel of St. Anselm's College, he wrote this. He says, high-intensity conventional warfare, like nuclear war, is too terrible to fight anymore. It's too intense. Look what verse 4 says. It says, and there was given to him a great sword, the phrase before, that people should kill one another. And they're going to be doing it. Look at verse 5, seal number 3. The third seal speaks of starvation and famine. And, you know, that's another. Remember I said all these parallel Jesus? What did Jesus say? I'm the bread of life. Apart from me, you'll starve. Well, apart from him, the world is going to starve. And it says that a denarius, that's one day's wage, or 15 cents, a slave could work a whole day and earn 15 cents, and he would get enough food to feed his family. But you know what it says here? Look what it says. It says that three quarts of barley will be a denarius, and one quart of wheat for a denarius. Did you know that that's an eighth as much as they could buy back then? And so what we see is that, there, that you have to have eight times as much money to buy the same amount of food is what they're trying to communicate with us. We don't have quarts of barley and denarii anymore. But what he's saying is, to, if you look at what it meant to the people that, that read it 2,000 years ago, it means that everything will cost eight times more than it does now. So what does a loaf of bread cost, a dollar or two? How would you like to pay 16 one loaf of bread. You wouldn't have peanut butter sandwiches anymore, right? 
How would you like to pay, you know, eight dollars per gallon of gas? Uh, how would you like to pay twenty-four dollars per gallon of milk? Do you see what famine means? There's not enough money to buy this. And what happens is that starvation occurs. Now, we can see this in the world today. Uh, if you go to, to uh, Zacalo, that's Mexico City's great central square, and if you go just off that great central square, there's a barrio called the Morla Morelos Barrio. And in that barrio, there is starvation occurring this morning in Mexico City, just south of our country with all of our wealth. If you go through its dusty, potholed streets and the narrow entryways, you will follow passages that lead to a gloomy world of starvation in the shadow of the United States. On each side of this barrio, there are roofless patios, and off each patio are ten-room jumbles, little warrens where people live. In each room, a family lives. Each family averages five people. To each of these tenements... Ten-room tenements, there will be a hundred people living with two bathrooms to serve them, and a bathroom is a bucket at the end of the patio. And from that place permeates the odors of grease and sewage with flies buzzing relentlessly, and the people who live there consider themselves lucky because they can pick through the garbage heaps of Mexico City, and only a few of them starve to death. Globally, this is going to hit... And it seems like Mexico City looks like the anteroom to an ecological Hiroshima, is how some people have described it. And we're just talking about one city of many across the planet where starvation is already with us. God said it's going to cover the planet. Look at verse 7, the fourth seal is death. And when he opened the fourth seal, I heard a voice of the fourth living creature say, Come and see. And, and this pale horse, and it's interesting, the pale horse, the word is the Greek word chloros. Uh, which is a pale, sickly green. That's where we get the word chlorine from, like chlorine gas. It's interesting that when John wrote this, he uses the word for chlorine gas long before anybody thought of using it in warfare as they did in World War I and with its sickening, deadly, horrific effects. If you remember gas warfare from the uh, warfare movies. But you know what I see here is Jesus said that he was the resurrection and the life. When you remove him from the world, what do you have? You have death. And that's why death and Hades come out in this sickly green color, killing one-fourth of the population. That's what it says in verse 8. It says, The power was given them over a fourth of the earth to kill with sword, hunger, and death. We already talked about sword. That's the warfare. Hunger, we just talked about starvation. Death, of course, happens when you are in warfare or starving. But what is this end of, of verse 8? This beast of the earth stuff. I mean, that is what is amazing. Well, in the 16th century, when Anton von Leeuwenhoek first devised the lens for a crude microscope, and he ground those lenses, he wrote in his journal when he affixed it onto a little stand and took one drop of water out of his bucket that he was drinking out of, and he put it on a piece of glass, and he adjusted it, and he was writing in his journal, and he said, Oh, the amazing beasties that live in water. And he saw these, these tiny microorganisms with their, with their claws and their teeth and their cilia and their flagellations, and he called them beasties. Well, I believe there's a day coming, and if you think for a moment, there are vast legions of deadly beasties that live around all of us this morning. And I just want to read to you a few, and I hope that you know, you'll go right out here and wash your hands and be careful, okay? Uh, but let me just read you about the legions of deadly agents that are surrounding us this morning that each possess the capability and are seemingly lining up, even as I speak, toward decimating major parts of the population of this planet. Let's take TB or tuberculosis. It was once thought to have been a conquered disease, but it's reemerged. It's reemerged in highly resistant strains that have even been known to piggyback with HIV to make HIV contagious in an airborne infection. And if you know anything about TB, you know that the Center for Disease Control is fearful of a global outbreak of tuberculosis because it's just resistant to all the strains of, of anything that we would throw against it. How about staph infection? One-fifth of of all the hospital systems, two million infections a year. Now, I'm not talking about people go in with infection. I'm talking about people in the hospital that get infected with staph. A fifth of them 
that get infected in the hospitals get staff. 60 to 80,000 people die in our hospitals every year because of staph infection. I mean, everybody knows that. That's nothing new. This is no alarm deal. But there's one strain of staph that is worse. I mean, the most deadly. It's called Staphylococcus aureus. It is resistant now to even the big gun. And formerly, when all antibiotics didn't work, they'd bring out their vancomycin and they'd, they'd shoot it down. But now this Staphylococcus aureus is resistant to everything. And it showed up in a little four-year-old in Japan for the first time in a little boil the child was brought in. And that infection took over and killed the child. And they gave the child everything known to man. And nothing stopped the onslaught of an infection that infects millions but now with the deadly intensity. What's amazing is if aureus comes out, it is so deadly that legions of people will die. How about Ebola? We all hear about Ebola, but that's in Africa, right? It has a mortality rate of 90% plus. It kills people in less than a week in a very horrible way. Connective tissues of the body liquefy. Can you imagine all your connective tissues? You know, all of them liquefying? But that's not all. When it takes off, every orifice of the body begins to bleed, and the infected individual, as they're dying, convulses and causes the blood that's coming out of them to splash, infecting everyone that it touches. There is no known cure. There is no known treatment. In fact, there's no awareness of how it's even transmitted. It's chilling, to say the least, if it started in a major populated area. Can you imagine convulsing bodies? Of course, Clancy wrote a novel about it, but can you imagine if it really happens? How about some of the biological warfare agents, anthrax? I mean, anthrax is very cheaply produced. It's a poor man's atom bomb. Once infected, the area that hit, is hit with anthrax is persistently a problem for decades. In fact, if, if the Allies would have dropped an anthrax biological bomb on Berlin, you could still not live in Berlin today, 50 years later. In fact, the Allies were testing anthrax in World War II on a little island off the coast of the And to this day, anthrax persists on that island and no human life can live there. That's how deadly it is. Right, here's another one. Yersinia pestis. Well, to us non-doctor types, that's the, the bubonic plague. But listen to what it's like. It's a rod-shaped, non-modal, non-sporulating, gram-negative aerobic bacterium. In other words, it killed tens of millions of Europeans during the Middle Ages, and it's being cultivated this morning in terrorist countries' laboratories around the world. Black death, as it was called in the 1400s, goes from rats to fleas to humans, to hemorrhages to suffocation to general toxemia to death. And you can grow it in a room in your house with a mere $10,000 worth of equipment and 15 feet in each direction, square room. That's all you need. You can grow it this morning. How about botulism, botulinum toxin? This is the most powerful poison known to man. It produces nausea, then diarrhea, then dizziness, then respiratory paralysis, and finally death, all from a cultured bacteria called Clostridium botulinum. Anyone can grow it in your little lab that I just talked to you about. In 1986, Ma'an Sheila in Oregon confessed to growing and spreading not botulism, but uh, another little pesky little organism that this terrorists grew trillions of salmonella bacteria and took them and sprayed them in salad bars and infected 750 people who got critically ill in Oregon. They caught the terrorists, shut down the lab. What we're talking about in the seething cauldron of hatred on our planet. There are beasts of the earth that are multiplying in laboratories in the Middle East and other parts of the world that someday are going to spill out into the deadliest hour of this planet. Did you know when John wrote these words 2,000 years ago, there was nothing known on the planet that could kill a fourth of all the people. I mean, you, there was not enough soldiers to do that. There was no known armament that could do that until World War II with the atom bomb. But since then, many other agents have come forward, biological 
So deadly are these beasts of the earth that Jesus said, and you might want to turn, keep your finger here, but turn back to Mark 13 for just a minute. Remember I told you Jesus commented on all this? Well, I think Jesus was commenting on perhaps biological warfare when he says in Mark 13, verse 20, and this is Jesus sitting on the placid quietness of the Mount of Olives, looking over at the glistening gold of the temple of Jerusalem. He said this, And unless the Lord, Mark 13, shortened those days, no flesh would be saved. Unless the Lord halts the beasts of the earth, nobody would be left alive. That's how bad it's going to get. And we're only on the fourth seal. Okay, back to Revelation 6. And I'll just finish these. The fifth seal is martyrs. When he opened the fifth seal, there were these martyrs. So there's going to be an incredible persecution. It says in verses 9 through 11 of Revelation 6. And when you take the light of the world out, there's only impenetrable darkness. And nobody wants Jesus around. And so all of his witnesses will be snuffed out one after another. And it's going to be one of the the greatest times of martyrdom in the history. And these in terrible martyrdom are up under the throne of God. You know, we know a little bit about this when we look at the records of World War II. In 10 years, 60% of the Jews in Europe were killed by Hitler. Six million of them were butchered. The torture, the starvation, the mass murder, the diabolical experiments on living human guinea pigs. History does not record a crime perpetuated against so many victims or ever carried out with such calculated cruelty, someone said. Mass murder was becoming a state industry with byproducts, and that's only one page of the sordid history of modern persecutions of humanity. There are many pages more, and the world is getting ready for the breaking of this seal. Well, real quickly, I want to to finish these, but just before I do, I want to say this. What, What would God want us to do, knowing all this, that there's going to be this false peacemaker, and there's going to be starvation and warfare, and the beast of the earth is going to break out, and the Antichrist is going to hunt down and systematically kill all the believers that are left on the planet? that are led to Christ, what on earth is God doing? What does he want us to do with all this happening? Well, let me just share something with you. You might want to jot them on your notes somewhere. But Jesus Christ calls us to walk in faithfulness. And and why these, these martyrs are under the throne is that they were faithful even to death. And if you want to be faithful to Christ in death, you have to be faithful to him in life. And, and I just wrote down six things that help us to be faithful to him in life. And I'm just going to read them, not even comment on them. To be faithful in Christ in life, our lives have to be a daily sacrifice, Romans 12, 1 and 2. So our lives, a sacrifice to Christ every day. Number two, our devotion has to be a continual burnt offering to him. And that is described in Mark 12, 33, our devotion as a continual burnt offering to him. Thirdly, we pour out our service as a drink offering to him, 2 Timothy 4, 6. That means that we give to the Lord what we can't get back. We serve him with our time, with our energy, with our lives, with our life strength. Fourthly, our deeds are intentional spiritual sacrifices. We go and we, we intentionally serve him with deeds and acts of kindness that are just like bringing, just like the lambs and the bullocks and the, the doves that they brought in the Old Testament, Old Covenant. They intentionally brought them. We bring our deeds to Christ. 1 Peter 2.5 and Hebrews 13.16 describe that. Our prayers are to be constantly ascending as an incense offering to him. As it says in Psalm 141, verse 2 and, and Revelation 8, 3 and 4. And finally, our earnest worship is to be poured at his feet as a praise offering. Hebrews 13. So what does God want us to do? He wants us to be sacrificing our lives and giving him our devotion and giving him our service and giving him our deeds of kindness and our prayers and our worship. And what will he do? He'll collect them and keep them and treasure them. And someday, look us in the eye and honor us because we were good and faithful servants. Now, do you realize that the world is headed to disaster? Do you realize that the plague has broken out? I'm not talking about botulism or anthrax. I'm talking about sin. It's worse. And you hold the antidote And all you have to do is speak the wonderful words of life. If you saw someone convulsing and choking to death, wouldn't you be drawn to to do something, hit them on the back or do the Heimlich or something on them? I mean, what if they were in your family? You'd be right all over them. You have the only known antidote to sin in this book. And God told us what's happening in the tribulation so we would 
know the terror of the Lord and persuade people. And tell them it's going to be so bad, they don't want to stay around. Well, let's look at the last seal, chaos. Verse 12, I looked when he opened the sixth seal. There's a cosmic earthquake. Basically, Jesus said he was a good shepherd and he would lead us in the right direction. When the world won't follow him, it goes in the wrong direction. There will be earthquakes, darkening of the sun, the moon is red as blood, meteors, disturbance in the atmosphere, terror, and the rich and poor alike. And this is the great day of wrath. And what I think about that when I read it is, number one, God has given us a conclusion to human history. And it's in this book, so we need to trust him completely. And God has given us a job to do for him while he's away. It's called soul winning. And so therefore, we should obey him now. And he's going to ask us whether or not we shared the good news we knew our whole Christian life with someone else. I hope you're ready to answer that question. It's not just the EE teams that are going to be quizzed by God whether or not they were soul winners. It's all of us. For them, it's easy. For us, it's hard. But we still do it. Thirdly, God has given us a way to stay in touch with him, time in this book, and we should start daily contact in the word and prayer with him every day. And finally, God has given us a means to start an investment account in heaven through sacrificial giving that will never go through the vicissitudes of the financial ups and downs. And therefore, we should give sacrificially to support his church and be heavily involved in pleasing him and making disciples. The mystery of God's delay is before us. In the sixth chapter, he delays no more. Before that angel sounds the beginning of the tribulation, before we are ushered out of this planet to surround his throne, we should be giving our lives as a sacrifice, our words of worship, our deeds of kindness, our incense of prayers offered up, and we should be delivering the antidote to the people dying around us. Father, I thank you that we have the wonderful words of life. I pray that we would sing them in our heart and speak them with our lips. And as we see these seals that you unfasten and scroll the events of the future, we're glad we're on the winning side. We're glad that the terrors and the famines and the starvation and the murder and the warfare and the beasts of the earth shall not attack us, but they are going to attack those we love. And we want to, as Paul, knowing the terror of the Lord, persuade people to come to Christ. And if Paul was terrified and persuaded men and women, and if you, Lord Jesus, were moved with compassion because you saw the judgment day coming, I pray that by your grace we would not be any less than good and faithful servants. We commit ourselves to that. And pray that we would be faithful in your word and faithful in our worship of you so that it will just be a part of everyday life to tell people about the only antidote, the only safe spot on the planet in the arms of Jesus. If there are any who are not trusting in you this morning, may they say yes to you, Lord Jesus. We pray that you will give a great increase, that you will draw many to yourself, and that we will worship you today in serving you. May your love draw us be witnesses like the 144,000. In your precious name we pray, Lord Jesus, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen.